Good afternoon, glad that you're here. We're gonna open with our opening story and then we'll go into prayer and get into our study. So here we go. So one day a professor asked his students to prepare for a quiz and he handed out the pe question paper with the text facing down as usual. Once he'd handed them all out, he asked the students to turn the page and begin. To everyone's surprise, there was no questions, just a black dot in the center of the page. The professor then said, I want you to write what you see there. The students, confused, got started on the in inexplicable task. And at the end of the class, the professor read each one of them aloud in front of all the students. All of them, with no exceptions, described the black dot, trying to explain its position in the middle of the sheet, etc. After all had been read, the classroom was silent. The professor began to explain. I'm not going to grade you on this. I just wanted to give you something to think about. No one wrote about the white part of the paper. Everyone focused on the black dot and the same happens in our lives. We always focus on the dark spots. Our life is a gift given to us by God with love and care and we always have reasons to celebrate. However, we insist on focusing only on the dark spots, the health issues that bother us, the lack of money, the complicated relationship with a family member, the disappointment with a friend, etc. He continued, the dark spots are very small compared to everything we have in our lives, but they are the ones that pollute our minds. Take your eyes away from the black spots in your life. Enjoy each one of your blessings, each moment that life gives you. Be happy and live positively. I loved that story today. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and open with prayer. Lord, I thank you for those that are here. I thank you for those that will listen. I pray that your message goes out. I pray that your word is heard and shared. I pray that those that hear will be rejoiced, that will, that will hear what they need, and that they will apply it to their lives and they will share it with others in need. Lord, I just pray that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit right now. I pray that I would be able to rightly divide the word of truth, and I thank you that I'm able to share your word with these that hear. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we are going to get started and we're going to be still doing the healing miracles of Jesus Christ and we just finished yesterday with the man at Bethsaida so we're going on to the withered hand there was a healing of a man with a withered hand and that is in we're going to start it in Matthew 12 9 through 13 Matthew 12 9 through 13 Matthew 12 little more windy today actually that's nice because it's really beautiful down here in San Diego but I am from the desert so not used to this weather Matthew 12 9 through 13 let's see Matthew 12 I think I put this down in between let's do that Matthew 12 9 through 13 going on from that place and the place he was at was where they were talking about the Lord's Sabbath and Jesus went through the grain fields and they were trying to get him for picking grain because they were hungry. Well, now he's going on from that place. And he went into their synagogue, their synagogue, the Jewish synagogue, the place where the Jews would get together their church, okay? And a man with a shriveled hand was there. Looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, they asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? because God forbid we do something wonderful for someone on the Sabbath because we're not supposed to do any work on the Sabbath, which is why they were on him for picking the grain out of the fields because they said that was work on the Sabbath. So Jesus says, he said to them, if any of you has a sheep and it falls into the pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more, how much more valuable is a man than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. We tend to get hung up on rules and laws. And if we do this and this and this, God will be pleased with us. I'm such a good Christian. I'm such a good person because I do this and this and this. 
But if our heart isn't right in the things that we do, it doesn't matter what we do, we're not right with God. It doesn't matter that you're a good person, good people go to hell. I'm sorry, I know that's probably really shocking to some people, but doing good things is not a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. A personal relationship with Jesus Christ causes you to want to do good things, but doing good things by themselves does not give you eternal life. Very clear, let's be clear, okay? So he says, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. But he didn't stop there. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. So he stretched it out and it was completely restored. Just as sound as the other, but the Pharisees went out and plotted how they might kill him. He did nothing to them he was not doing anything that was against the law. He merely told the man to stretch out his hand. Now this man, it was his choice. He did not have to stretch out his hand. He could have stayed in his infirmity. He could have stayed broken and he could have chose to not stretch out his hand. And a lot of times we get scared and we hold on to the things that are broken in our lives because we lack the faith to stretch out our hands and receive the blessing that God has for us. And that's where Jesus was at with this man. These Pharisees are trying to accuse him and get him to slip up because they want to kill him. And this man is broken. And instead of being hung up in, in the problem of the world that was going on here, Jesus took the time with the man that was broken and he offered healing to him. But it was at the man's choice to accept that healing just like salvation is our choice healing is our choice we have to choose to reach out to christ for it we have to choose to receive it you can't god is not going to make something come upon you jesus said stretch out your hand it was the man's choice whether he stretched stretched out his hand or not and this man stretched out his hand and what happened he was completely restored he was completely restored. Now, does that mean that every time we stretch out our hands to the Lord, the Lord will always answer and give us complete healing and restoration? Yes, but not the way we always think he should because he's not a genie in a bottle, right? He's gonna answer what he answers, the way he answers, in the time he answers, because he is God and we are not. So his answers are not our answers. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. So we can't get bitter when his answers don't line up with what we think God should do at this point in time because he sees the entire picture from the beginning before time began to the end when time ends all at one time. And we can only see what's happening right now in this moment. So you, it will not make sense to you. The way God reacts and what God does does not make sense to you. Good afternoon, Miss Gladys, I'm glad you're with me. But that doesn't, that's not what God's concerned about. God is concerned about your holiness. He's not always concerned about your happiness. He does give us things and bless us with things that make us happy, but he's more concerned with our holiness. That's why he brings restoration to this man. And that's why he's still willing to talk to these Pharisees because he's more concerned with their holiness between them and God than with their happiness of following laws. And these Pharisees miss it again. They miss Jesus speaking out to them and trying to reach out to them. And what do they plot to do at the end? They plot to kill him for restoring this man. They plot to kill him because he's showing them up in how God is working through him. Do we get bitter and angry when other people have the ability to be used by God and we are not? And we don't take that moment to look within ourselves and see what's wrong with my relationship with God, but we wanna point our finger at other people and condemn them? Where's your heart? Where's your heart? All right, so our next one is on the crowd in Galilee and we're going to be in Matthew 4 23 through 25 there's a healing in the crowd in Galilee Galilee Matthew 4 23 through 25 okay Matthew 4 23 through 25 Matthew 4 
23 through 25. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother, is that it? Nope, that's Matthew 5, because I was like, that's not a miracle. Matthew 4, 23, here we go. Jesus heals the sick. Matthew 4, 23 through 25. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. Let's stop there. Jesus went throughout Galilee teaching in their synagogues. He didn't go through religious teaching as a rabbi. He was not a rabbi. He was not a Levite. Yet, yet he was teaching in their synagogues. Why? Because when you are God's anointed, you can't help but teach wherever God puts you. You can't help but preach whatever God gives you. And there's those of you that are listening that have a word that God has given you and you're keeping it silent and you're holding it back and there's someone that needs it and you need to be bold and you need to share it wherever you're at. You need to use whatever in any situation you're in to share that bold word that God has given you. Be teaching in the synagogues. Be teaching where the people are at that are in need because the people that were in need were the ones that thought they were the closest and best to God. Those were the people that were in need. Yet those were the people that rejected Jesus. He was teaching in their synagogues. He was preaching the good news. Are we preaching the good news? Are we living the good news? Are we an example of good news? Or are we an example of, woe is me. God has allowed this in my life again. Are we always focused on what God has not like the black dot on the page in our beginning story where we focus on the black dot when all the white page is surrounding it. Focus on the white page around that black dot in your life. There may be a black dot in your life. I'm not saying there isn't, but focus on the tremendous amount of white space, light, purity that God has given in your life. Focus on the positive. Get your eyes off of that black dot in your life. He was preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. He was healing every disease and sickness among the people. The people were going to him and the people were receiving their healing. It's a miraculous thing. God can do the miraculous. God can heal any and every disease. But our healing isn't always physical. We have to always remember that healing is physical, it's spiritual, it's emotional. God is concerned about our holiness, not just our happiness, right? News about him spread all over Syria and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, demon possessed, those having seizures, the paralyzed, he healed them. Large crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan followed him. When we are bringing healing and life to people's lives, we will lead people to Jesus Christ. Jesus was bringing healing to people's lives, and he was leading people to hear the good news about Jesus, the good news about God, the good news that God was coming and God is here and God cared about them. Are we doing that? Are we leading others to Christ? Are we being the ones that's bringing healing or are we bringing depression? Are we bringing people down? Are we bringing people and detracting from the glory of God? Because our purpose here on this planet is to give God glory, not to receive what we can from the world around us. Good afternoon, Miss Sophia, I'm glad that you're here. Okay, so our next miracle is the centurion son. Now this one is a little different than the official son. So let's look at the centurion son, and that is in Matthew 8, 5 through 13. Matthew 8, 5 through 13. Matthew 8, 5 through 13. Ready? Okay, so the faith of the centurion. When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home, paralyzed, and in terrible suffering. Centurion, Roman, not a, gen not a, a Gentile, not a Jew. So not of the people of God, right? He is not one of the ones that Jesus initially came to speak to because he came to first give the good news to the Israelites, right? But he's a centurion. 
And he's not even there for himself. He's not even there for his family. This centurion has went to where Jesus is for his servant, for his servant. What are we willing to do? What are we willing to risk? What are we willing to put aside for the needs of others? Are we stepping out? Are we reaching out to be able to meet the needs of others? Or are we so consumed with what's going on in our lives that people are in need around us and we're missing the mark? Don't miss the mark. He, the centurion here is not missing the mark, but he has a servant that is in need and in suffering and he's gone to Jesus himself. He didn't send someone else because it was too important. He made sure that he went himself because he wanted to see that this was taken care of. And we see in verse seven, Jesus said to him, I will go and heal him. I will go, I will go and heal him. Jesus is willing to go out of his way to heal the centurion, ser the, centur the servant of a centurion, okay? But what do we see in verse eight? The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I am myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell you this, I tell one this go and he goes and that one come and he comes. I say to my servant, do this and he does it. Let's stop, let's pause there. This centurion calls Jesus, first he calls him Lord. He's not even saying rabbi or calling him any, he's calling him Lord because he realizes that Jesus has the power to do what he's doing. He realizes in faith that Jesus is who he is and that he is not worthy to have Jesus come to him personally in his bodily form. So what is he saying? Just, just tell him, just say the word. This centurion has enough faith to say, Jesus, just say the word and I know your word will heal. Do we have that kind of faith? When we are in need, when we are in lack, when we are not knowing what direction to take, when our, serv when, our, when our children are in pain, when our finances are low, when our marriage is in rock on the rocks, do we go to the word? Do we trust that Jesus' word is enough to heal? Or do we need more? Do we need more what the world has to offer? Because this centurion had the faith to say, just say the word. Just say the word and my servant will be healed. What does Jesus say about it? Verse 10. When Jesus heard this, he was astonished. Astonished. I love that. Jesus is a real person, okay? Jesus is, a, is God, but Jesus is human. And he is astonished at the centurion's faith. And he said to those following him, I tell you the truth, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now for us that might be like, whoa, that sounds kind of severe. What is Jesus saying there? He's saying this centurion has great faith. He doesn't know the law. He doesn't have the Torah. He hasn't been raised knowing who God is his whole life. He's heard what Jesus has done. He's maybe heard about the miracles that he's, he's done and he's heard about the teachings of what he said. And he has the faith to go out of his way to ask for healing for a servant and yet not even request that Jesus go to him, but takes Jesus at his word. Are we willing to have the faith that takes Jesus at his word? And Jesus says of him, I am astonished. I have never seen, I have not seen in all Israel this kind of faith. And so with that, he's saying that many will come from the east and the west and sit at the feast with the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's us. That's us today, the Christians that are going to come from all over the east and the west. Many people were going to come to know the Lord. He came for the Israelites because they were the chosen people. They were the children of God, right? But they rejected him. And so from that now, salvation is open to all people. And he's including the centurion in on that salvation because he has the faith to believe more than anyone in Israel. And because of that, 
he's saying, yes, people are going to come from the east and the west and accept Christ, but then there are also those, but the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown out into the darkness where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. We don't want to be the subjects of the kingdom, the ones that have learned who God is, that know who God is, but reject and lack the faith to have that relationship with who God is. Just knowing God is not enough. We need a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. We need to have faith and in his word, just like the centurion did. That's why they were thrown out. That's why they're in the darkness. That's why there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. When we lack a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and we trust in the traditions of going to church and doing what our forefathers have always done, and this has always worked for them, so it'll work for me, no. No, because if you're hearing this today, it means you need a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. If that's the kind of relationship you've had with him, you need a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's not enough. And so what does he say? Verse 13. Then Jesus said to the centurion, go, it will be done just as you believed it would. And his servant was healed at that very hour. Go, it's going to be just like you believed it would. And it was at that very hour. That's the power of God. That's the power of God for this centurion. That's the power of God in your life. That's the power of God in my life. Because God will do exactly what he says he's going to do when he says he's going to do it. We need to have the faith to trust that God is God and we are not. And in his word is the power to heal. In his word is the power to save. In his word is the power to rejuvenate our lives. To give us the faith that we need to get through another day. I don't want to go over time again like I did yesterday. Okay, so I got about 10 minutes. We're going to go through one more story. And it's going to be the widow's son. And the widow's son's story of healing is in Luke 7. Nope, Luke. Centurion son, widow's son. Luke 7, 11 through 17. Luke 7... 11 through 17. Luke 7, 11 through 17. 7, 11 through 17. Jesus raises a widow's son. Soon afterward, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went with him. And as he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, which means she had no livelihood. She would end up being either a prostitute or just begging on the street because your children cared for you in that culture, and she had no husband, which meant there was no one to care for her. And a large crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her, and he said, don't cry, don't cry. Another human aspect of God. Don't think that God doesn't see your pain. Jesus saw her and he told her and his heart went out to her and he said, don't cry. Are you in a place where you're hurting? Jesus sees your pain and he sees and he sees your heart and his heart goes out to you in your pain and he says, don't cry, don't cry. Then he went up and touched the coffin, and those carrying it stood still. First of all, Jews could not touch anything dead. That would make them unclean. So for him to even touch the coffin was totally taboo in that culture, okay? But then what does he do? He says, young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to talk. So I guess he wasn't unclean because now that dead man is alive. And he says, he got up. He got up, the dead man sat up, began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. Don't cry. God's heart goes out to you. Do you have a child that's lost to you? Do you have a child that is not walking with God? God sees your heart. Don't cry. God can bring life into something that's dead. Is your marriage dead? 
Is there a relationship that's dead? Is there something in your life that has no life left in it? God can bring life to the dead. Does it mean he's gonna raise the dead that someone has lost that's listening to this? Not necessarily, but God can reach out his heart to you and his heart does go out to you and he will answer in the way that is best for you. And what does his answer here do? His answer fills those with awe and they praise God. They say he's a great prophet. God has come to help his people. News of him spreads throughout Judea and the surrounding country. God is here to meet our needs in the best way possible. Do you believe that? If you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, God is here to meet that need. We look at the Romans road and Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We fall short in the ability to have a relationship with Jesus Christ because sin that we were born into separates us from Jesus Christ. From the moment we are born, we are born into condemnation, we are born into sin, we are born separated from God. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. We are deserving of death. From the moment we are born, we are born to die, die eternally. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. If we choose to reach out our hand and accept that salvation, we accept eternal life. We leave death away, we leave death behind, and we are accepting of eternal life. Romans 5, 8 says, God's love for us is that while we were still sinners, born into the sin, in condemnation, going to be condemned to death, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for you. Christ died for me. Christ gives you the hope of heaven. Christ gives you a future. Christ gives you a hope. There is hope in Jesus Christ. And what does it say? Romans 10, 9 through 10 says, if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, and we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. You have salvation in Jesus Christ. Do you believe it? Do you have it? You need a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not enough that you go to church on Sunday, that you pray the rosary, that you go on a mission trip. It's not enough to do tradition. You have to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Hi, Adam, I'm glad that you're watching. So what does it look like to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? It's, it's a simple prayer. It's you coming to understand who you are, and what Jesus is. It's, it's a prayer that goes something like this. Lord, I admit that I'm a sinner. I admit that I fall short. Lord, I believe that you're Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And I confess that I need a Savior. I ask that you would be my Savior. I accept your free gift of salvation, and I wanna live my life for you. In Jesus' name, amen. That's it. It's you accepting a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And then what? And then what it says, Romans 10, 13 says, For whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever. There are whosoever's in your life that need to know who God is. We need to be. Be sharing. Be sharing what God is doing in your life. Be. Be in prayer. Be in prayer. Talking to God with what's going on in your life. Be. Be in the Word. Be in the Word so you can know what God is it has and says to you and you need to be be involved in a bible believing church so you can have a personal relationship with jesus christ so you can grow so you can help others to grow we need to be doing those things and as we do those things and we have a personal relationship with jesus christ we can read in first chronicles as i get there first chronicles 4 10 says we can call out to god and god will hear us when we're honorable, when we have a personal relationship with him. We can cry out to God and we can say, God, bless me. Bless me so I can be a blessing to others. God, enlarge my territory. Enlarge my land. Enlarge my sphere of influence so I can be a blessing to other people. Use me wherever I'm at to be able to share your word and give you glory. Lord, be with me. Be with me so I'm not alone, so I'm, be with me in front of me, be with me behind me, be with me alongside me so I'm not alone, so that I can go forward boldly knowing that I am with you. 
and we can ask the Lord to be, to be keeping us, to protect us, to keep us from harm. We can ask those things of God when he, we have a personal relationship with him. And I pray that if you do not have a personal relationship with him, that you would think about that, that you would, that this message would cause you to want to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, that you would be able to pray the prayer of Jabez and ask for the Lord to bless you and ask for the Lord to increase your, to increase your land and increase your territory, increase your sphere of influence, to ask for the Lord to be with you, to ask for the Lord to protect you and he will. Not always the way we think he should, but exactly how he needs to. And I thank you and I, I, I thank you that you're here. I thank you that you've listened and I pray that you would just share and be a blessing and be blessed. Thanks. <laughs>